Hey, so today we have one of our incredible teaching team members. God is just blessing us with a great, diverse, um, clever, I mean, boy, I'm going to run out of superlatives, but uh, incredible group of people who are comprising our Elevate Church teaching team. And we certainly want to make sure that we're exposing ourselves to a variety of voices, a variety of demographics, a variety of ages, cultures. And you're going to see that throughout the year. You're going to see a few familiar faces. You're going to see a few fresh faces. Here's one of our increasingly familiar faces, the incredible Marcy Painter with a very clever and a very valuable message today. Oh, good morning, Elevate. Thank you so much for having me back again. I feel so honoured uh, to be speaking to you today. And I just want to sort of delve into a very small topic, and that is the Bible. <laughs> You know, if you're a follower of Christ, you know that this book is an essential part of our faith. We are people of the book. But it's time for some honesty. It's okay to admit that you don't get it all, that there are parts you would rather avoid. Some people say the Bible is easy to understand, that it's the very word of God. The Bible says it, and I believe it, and that's that. But it's not that easy. It's okay that you, to admit that you don't understand it all. Now, some people say it's just an ancient document full of myths and stories relevant to the Hebrew people, but it has no relevance to modern Australians, and you are ignorant to attach special worth to it. I would say that such comments show no understanding of the arc of humanity and the incredible significance of the Bible in our history. But here's some good news. You can be a thinking, intelligent, rational, curious follower of Christ and 100% believe in the trustworthiness and inspiration of the Bible. But... We need to learn how to read it and how not to read it. So let me start with a quick brain dump of things that of ways that we shouldn't read it. Like don't read it as if it's a modern book. Don't read it like a history textbook or a science textbook or a legal rule book. It is an ancient document set in ancient cultural contexts. And also, don't read it on your own. We really need each other in order to understand it well. It was always meant to be um, interpreted in community. Now, we could talk for weeks on this topic, but I'm just going to delve into a few bits of it today. Let's just start with the origins of the Bible. Where do you think it came from? Well, we get some idea from the Bible itself in the letter Paul wrote to his young apprentice, Timothy. And he said this, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. Now that's in 2 Timothy 16 and 17. Another version of it says it like this. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of scripture is God breathed and useful one way or another. Inspired by God, God breathed. What exactly does that mean? Now, some of you may have been brought up in an evangelical tradition that taught you a doctrine of infallibility, that every word of the Bible came straight from the mind of God and therefore there could be no mistakes, no contradictions. Every word is of equal importance. 
Now, this idea really only took hold a few decades ago and is mainly a child of the American Evangelical Church. It's not such a big deal in other Christian traditions who would declare that the only infallible one is God himself. It's a complicated theory, but let me just say this. Can you make an argument for the infallibility of the Bible? Yes. Do you have to believe that in order to be a Christ follower? No. So let's ponder that thought that the Bible is God-breathed. Firstly, don't read the Bible as if God dictated it to robots. Now, Tim Mackey, who is a brilliant biblical scholar, and he is the, the mind behind the Bible Project videos, which I'm sure many of you have seen on YouTube, he uses this Escher picture called Drawing Hands to try to explain the inspiration of the Bible. This is a visual paradox which describes the Orthodox Jewish Christian view of the Bible. It is a thoroughly human and a thoroughly divine book. It is written by human people who are bound by their context and their place in history, and yet the breath of God is breathing through it. God speaks through this book. Now, some people want to rub out one of the hands. Now, if you rub out God's hand, we're left with a book with no divine spark, just human interpretations. And I don't believe this is true for reasons that I'll speak of at the end of this message. Some people want to rub out the human hand. So there's no human role in the writing. Some people find it hard to accept the authority of the Bible unless they see God putting people into trances and making them robots while he moved their hands to write the words. But accepting its humanness should not negate its power and authority as a vehicle through which God speaks. Jesus himself, we believe, was thoroughly human and thoroughly divine. This is a paradox. It's a paradox for the nature of Christ and it's a paradox for the nature of the Bible. Two different truths that can be true at the same time. We just have to get comfortable with that. The second thing I want to say is don't read the Bible without an awareness of your own interpretive lens, the glasses that you use to read the Bible. You have to approach the Bible with humility. Don't ever think that you know it all, understand it all, have it all nailed down. Every time we read the Bible, we are filtering it through our own wants and needs and biases. You know, between the scripture and our heart lies a whole world of past experiences and past voices and past teachers and past preachers and the latest podcast you've listened to. It's impossible for anyone to come to the Bible with a neutral stance. Let me say that again. It's impossible for anyone to come to the Bible with a neutral stance. Some of you will read the Bible and only see God's love and acceptance and grace. Some of you will read the Bible and only see God's commands and his rules and his law and his discipline when we fail to keep them. You know, even the country of our birth, the colour of our skin, our gender, our politics gives us a unique lens through which we interpret the Bible. In history, the Bible has been used to support monarchies, colonialism, socialism, dictatorships, revolutions, democracy, and even slavery, which is one of the most shameful and wonderful periods in church history. Why shameful? 
because slave owners quoted scripture to keep the system going. Why wonderful? Because Christian freedom fighters used scripture to fuel their conviction to have it abolished. We must be smart enough to recognize and admit our lenses and be humble enough to challenge them. Thirdly, don't forget that God is taking us somewhere in this grand story of the Bible. An understanding of the whole Bible's story is the single most important tool for getting the Bible right. We do not live in a circle of life. We live in a line. It had a beginning and it will have an end. And it is essentially a cosmic love story. And this is a core Christian belief. And let's see if we can if we can tell the story like the, the meta-narrative. We start with creation, where we see God's incredible love for us. It's a creation birthed in equality and dignity and love. But God loved us enough to let us fly in freedom. He gave us free will. And, of course, we know from the stories of Adam and Eve and what happened that the next part of the story is what we call the fall. We have rejected God in so many ways. We have turned our back on him. We've, we've used our free will to sort of thumb our nose at God's plans for us. We've rejected his love, and in that we've rejected the love of fellow man. But, you know, right at the beginning, even as we were messing up God's plan, he already had a rescue in mind. There was always, always an ultimate plan to bring us back, to reconcile us back to him. So that plan is Jesus. God himself comes to earth and he announces in, in, the, in the person of Christ, he announces to world that, that there is a way back. And, and he, God himself, takes on our sin and pays the price for it on the cross. And he calls out to us, join me and we will work to bring the kingdom of God to reality. He leaves his spirit with us. He leaves his spirit to enter us to, so that we can accomplish his work to make the vision come true. What is that vision? Well, we see, we see tantalizing glimpses of it in Revelation, the last book in the New Testament. I looked again. I saw a huge crowd, too huge to count. Everyone was there, all nations and tribes, all races and languages. And I heard a voice thunder from the throne. Look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. They're his people. He's their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. All the first order of things gone. And the enthroned continued, look, I am making everything new. He will come again to bring heaven to earth and to make his home with his people. That is the arc, the meta narrative of scripture. So when you read sections of the Bible that seem to be okay with the practice of slavery, we compare it to where the trajectory of Scripture. Where is the story of the kingdom going? There will be no slavery in the kingdom of God. When we read some sections that seem to put women down, we compare it to the trajectory of our ultimate destination in God. 
There will be no discrimination in the kingdom. All God's people will be loved. All will be valued. God is working all things towards his plan of redemption for all. Now, how do I know this? I read it in the scripture itself. I read this trajectory. We see the way God is moving us in a direction. And let me tell you a quick story. It's a powerful one that makes me love God even more. You know, in the Old Testament um, scriptures, it was very clear that the Jewish people were set apart as a nation of priests, and they were to keep themselves holy by avoiding contact with Gentiles. They, they were the those people who were outside of their religion in other tribes. Now, in the time between the Old and the New Testaments, the separation of Jews and Gentiles became more and more pronounced. To, to the extent that no law-abiding Jew would be seen dead anywhere near a Gentile, let alone eating in their home. Now, if we fast forward about 200 years, Jesus has come, he has revealed himself and the character of the kingdom of God. And after that first miraculous Easter, has returned to his father, leaving the early church to spread the good news with the help of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to come in here at in uh, the book of Acts, which is the story of the early church. And in the chap in chapter ten in Acts, there are two things happening simultaneously. In one place, you have a, uh, a man named Cornelius. He is a Roman centurion. He is a Gentile, but a compassionate man. And he has a vision where an angel tells him to send his servant to a town called Joppa to bring home a Jewish man named Peter. You get that? Cornelius is a Gentile. Peter is a Jew. All right, at the same time this is happening, over here in Joppa, Peter is praying on a rooftop and he sees a vision of sort of the sheep being lowered out of heaven that is full of all of the things that Jews are commanded in the Old Testament not to eat. For instance, pork and shellfish. And in his vision, he hears God say, Peter, get up and eat. And Peter says, no way, God. I know my scripture. It says that I shouldn't eat this stuff. And God says to him again, Peter, rise up and eat. And Peter says, are you trying to trick me into dis disobeying you, God? But God says to him, Peter, if I say it's okay to eat, it's okay. Don't call something unclean. If I've told you, it's good. Weird dream. But at that very moment, there's a knock on the door and there's a guy downstairs and it is Cornelius's servant. And he says to him, my master has sent me to you and asked you to come and visit him. So Peter, who without that vision would have probably said, no way, you're a Gentile, He's smart enough to know God's trying to tell him something. So Peter goes with these Gentiles, who every other Jew would have considered to be dirty, impure, not to be associated with, and he enters Cornelius' house. And what does he see? A group of people hungry for the good news about God. And the light bulb goes on. God, this is what you are doing. This is where you are taking us out of prejudice and discrimination and towards radical acceptance and unity. Peter fairly exploded with his good news. And it says in Acts, he said, it's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favourites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open. 
The message he sent to the children of Israel, that through Jesus Christ, everything is being put together again. Well, he's doing it everywhere, amongst everyone. Peter does something opposite to his known scripture, which would have been the Old Testament, the Torah. In order to follow the voice of God as it leads in the direction that God is now taking his people, God is always doing something new, but step by step, he's always heading in the same direction towards the full revelation of who he is, and he is love. That is the best news you will ever hear. So let me finish by saying this. Do read this book as the authority and truth of God expressed through human authors. And how do I know it has divine authority? Well, here's something to think about. The early church grew and grew across the world for 300 years after Christ walked the earth without the official New Testament. Thousands of people believed in Jesus as the Messiah sent from God, not because they read about him, but because he came back from the dead. And this fact was witnessed by hundreds of people and they told the story of what they had seen. We have seen it with our own eyes. God himself is with us, not a great teacher, not a holy man, but God in flesh. Our faith is based on an event. The resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And this book has authority because it is a written witness to that fact. This word is a witness to the word. In John, he writes, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So what then should we do? Well, that's pretty simple. Read it. Meditate on it. Make space in your day for it. This is a core spiritual discipline for people who want to become like Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the Bible for the way you have allowed your wisdom and your timeless truth to be written down in a way that generation after generation, we can gather together and read it and hear your voice. Father, in the Psalms, it talks about those who read your word are like trees that are planted near streams of living water and they grow strong in all seasons and have fruit that can be accessed by others. They create shade that others can stand underneath. God, help us to absorb your word for the sake of those around us that need us to be a reflection of Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen.